um, that we've implemented, which is basically around splitting up big data into distinct partitions, which can then be processed in parallel and independently uh, as part of that, uh, that analysis, and then consolidating the results into one result in So it seems like you're working with one big data set, but in fact you're doing multiple things in parallel. Uh, we call these parallel external memory algorithms, and in the process of implementing a kind of suite of those, forces its analysis and making it available in our language uh, for revolutionary enterprise. And what that means is, we drink less coffee. Um, just to give you some examples, you know, just, just using ordinary uh, non-parallel methods. Uh, this is for logistic regression, I believe. You know, it takes quite a long time to do this kind of analysis, even for relatively small data sets. But having algorithms that scale to very, very large data sets and don't take much longer as you run, run through that means you can go around the interview process many, many more times and build much more powerful models. And of course, it's also important when it finally goes into production, you can apply those types of models to close them in real time and types of applications. So that's what they're parallel. And this is, I've been talking about this thus far in the context of a development process. You know, you're taking an extract of data, putting it in a local cluster, a local set of files, doing that iteration. But there are some applications too where the data is so large and living in a data warehousing appliance or living in Hadoop that it doesn't make sense to move the data. And sometimes you can't even move the uh, data. reason I'll get to that a little bit later on. But there is a solution in those types of environments. And that is, rather than moving the data over to where we're running the code, to develop the code and then move the code so it can run in the data. A lot of us think of Hadoop just as a file store. But of course, the Hadoop nodes are processes themselves. And you can run code on each of those processes. And this is something that the R language works particularly well for. It's a very well encapsulated language for describing analytics and data processes when you want data, which can then be farmed out through a MapReduce operation to all the individual nodes of a Hadoop cluster. And then you've got this massively parallel computing framework to do analytics on the data that's stored in Hadoop, which can then be consolidated uh, to do analysis. That applies equally well. There's, there's obviously a lot of differences in the architecture and implementation, but the principle is the same with data appliances. Uh, dedicated data appliances like the IBM Teaser appliance, it has basically 12 big servers in one big box, uh, 96 processes in the minimum configuration, high-speed data buses, and so forth. But we can do the same thing. I'm taking code that we develop either on a workstation in prototyping or in a server for production, and then move that code into the appliance using its processing power to do the same kinds of computations. If anyone's into the details of that, um, there's a whole bunch of information I'd like to that. Lastly, I'll say that the analysis piece is just a small part of the story. It's an important part of the story, but it's, it's not the entire story. We've already talked about the data side of it and how it's important that you know, whatever analysis system you choose to use, that it can interface with all the various kinds of data stores you might be working with. Because as I said already, in the data science process, there could be lots of different data types you work with. But then there's the, what do you do with the data part of the question. If you're building a data app, how can you interface that interactive application on a website with the computations of the analytics that in turn draw data from data sources and deliver results through that application? And of course, the same thing applies if you're integrating analytics into a business intelligence tool, or even if you're just doing simple reporting. You know, an entire ecosystem of technology that works together to make all that work is equally important. So to summarize, what does a data scientist need? Data scientists need data, needs data, obviously, but important, importantly needs to get an interface with lots of different kinds of data sources. A data scientist needs to be able to do exploratory data analysis, get their hands to work with the data, see what's in there. Um, needs access to a wide variety of statistical methods that run fast and work with big data, and the ability to actually run those within a data appliance or a Hadoop ecosystem by moving codes to data. 
Um, I haven't talked much about visualization, but it's important to be able to quality data visualization. That's a really important part of the communication aspect. And then if you're actually going to run this in a production system, to be able to run it in batch, uh, work with lots of different kinds of tools, and be able to integrate it into that whole ecosystem of technology. Uh, like I said, this is sort of the marketing part of the pitch uh, at Revolution Analytics. Uh, we have worked hard to make R, the R language, work in all these environments. Open Source R is an amazing language for doing data science. Uh, but it doesn't work so well when it comes to high performance and working with big data. Uh, with our product revolution, our enterprise, we added additional technology to open source R to make it work with big data, make it run fast and in parallel, make it possible to run in database and integrate into other systems. So with that, I've got a few minutes left. Uh, let me prognosticate a little bit and talk about the what I see as the future uh, the big data and it's based on the customers I've worked with and the data science community uh, I interact with uh, in the Bay Area. I think, first of all, it's kind of a trite thing to say, but data, science, data sets are not going to get any smaller. Big data is here to stay, and data is only getting larger. And I think, you know, one of the reasons for that is that, number one, there was a lot of data that was generated in the past that previously just we never collected it. It was only it was sampled instantaneously, like sensor data or web traffic data or packet data that now is routinely being stored because we have this massive cheap infrastructure like the Duke, like appliances, that just throw that data in there and now people are figuring out well, what can we do with it? And so data is just getting larger and larger and larger, like finding more and more applications uh, that we can do. Cloud computing. Uh, doing analytics in the cloud off the grid with Amazon Web Service and so forth hasn't been today a big part of big data, at least in my experience. But I see it becoming more. Uh, I think one of the reasons why it hasn't been a big part of big data thus far is practicality. If I have a terabyte of data and I want to upload it to AWS and do analytics on it, the only thing I can do is put that data on a tape put it in a truck, ship it to Amazon, and went to bed output. Not very practical, especially our data that changes all the time. But what we're seeing is more and more companies are routinely using data stores like AWS and Azure and so forth as the storage vehicle for all the streaming data. Because uh, it scales, they don't have their own infrastructure to maintain. Uh, the big example of that is Netflix. All of Netflix's data is in the cloud. And because that data is stored in the cloud, they're now thinking about what analytics can we do on that data that we're not doing already, and doing that in the cloud as well. So I see more, more, more sort of scope for doing cloud computing on big data as more companies store the data. Um, I think the demand for data scientists is it's hot now, but I'm going to continue to get hot. If you do a search on a job site like Indeed.com uh, for jobs that include the term data scientists, you can see it's, it's working now. Uh, like I said, I go to a lot of meetups and hackathons in the Bay Area. Every time you go there, you see a job board with pins all over it saying, we're looking for data scientists, we're hiring. And uh, you know, I think that's something that's spread around the world as well. And lastly, if I can prognosticate a little bit more about sort of where the different data technologies fit in and what their use cases are. You know, I think I get a lot of questions from clients in particular about, you know, we want to do big data. So I'm not really sure what big data means. Uh, but, you know, should we do a do? Should we buy an IBM and Teaser appliance? Should we be working on a distributed cluster? What should we do? And, you know, kind of the way I see this shaking up and, you know, kind of where our recommendations go to this way is that a dupe is a really good, really cheap, really cost-effective way of just storing massive amounts of data that's coming. You're not sure what to do with the data? Put it in Hadoop. You know, you don't, it's, it's not particularly accessible. It's not particularly performant. You have to be able to do a whole lot with that data if it's a great place to store it. And you have all that processing power the individual nodes to do interesting things with that data, to aggregate it, to select it, to sample it, to choose from it, and then with that bit of data polishing, you can store that data in a data appliance or a data warehouse, uh, like IBM that's easy. When it comes to developing models, to doing the data science, you know, the recommendation I tend to lean towards now is to do extracts from a data warehouse. I hope I've tried to convince you that data science is a good process. 
leads to more powerful models, it leads to more credible models, more useful models that people will actually sort of uh, use in practice. I think I've talked about you know, the technology platform that data science needs, but you know, in particular, one thing I want you to take away from this is that having a platform that lets you explore data and interact with data is a really important part of that process. I think R is an awesome language for doing that, and what we try to make revolution our enterprise scale of the needs of the kinds of problems that data scientists deal with today. I'll leave you with a few resources of things I've mentioned during the talk. I didn't mention this one, but it's a great paper. Uh, DJ Patel uh, at O'Reilly Radar, Building Data Science Teams. I don't think there are many individuals out there that have this combination of those three skills I was talking about. Substantive expertise, expertise, machine learning, and computer science, uh, statistics and computer science, but you can put those people together in teams that have some of those um, skills and, and put together braces in that way. DJ's got a great paper explaining how to do that right there. Um, I also write about data science statistics in our at the blog, blog Follow me on Twitter. Neil, thank you very much. Okay, we're going to try to put any questions, couple, one or two questions. Okay, then. Um, oh, I'm following you on Twitter. All right. Now I know who you are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All, right. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's awesome. Um, I'm Kai Sing. I'm from SMU. I'm a fourth year student there. I'll be graduating in three days. So, yay. Yay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Degree, or is that, uh, that where you put in your resume? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I'm here to talk about this heritage price. So basically, as you can see here, it's just a very nice number, 3 million. The main idea of this thing is a, is a competition that lasts for two years. So it began last, last year, so we have about one more year to go. The idea here is actually to do predictive analysis. You'll be given about uh, 2 million rows of data, the claims, it's like medical claims data of the United States. So the each claim data will have like attributes to it. So it's like so and so ID and there's like a bunch of mm, syndromes each of that each person has that causing to be a he or she to be admitted to the hospital. So based on these attributes, we're supposed to do predictive analysis to say that what are the how many days this person will stay in the hospital. The idea of this competition is because it's very wasteful for people to be admitted to the hospital as overstay or under, or some people who uh, they should be based on their attributes, they should stay longer, mm -hmm. understay, so very dangerous. So the next whole point is the main challenge here is that the attributes are, I'll say, it's, it's not, they don't give you a complete syndrome list. So if you look at the data set, there's only like maybe like a few dozens of uh, syndromes, like only heart disease, pregnancy, and so and so. So based on this uh, limited data uh, attributes, you your algorithms would be like, flexible enough such that when they, for example, they introduce new uh, syndromes that, that's outside of this data that's open to you, you are able to identify and predict properly how this person was state. So let's see. Currently, there's a leaderboard, and the, the cool thing is that the top people who actually have like the produce so called the best result have actually their paper. So you can actually download the paper to see they use R. So the, the best team now is R to do predictive analysis. So I scan through their, uh, their algorithm. You see what they are doing is uh, they are assigning weights to each different kind of symptoms. So for example, if you have a heart, if you have a heart if you have a disease, something that's the weight, then you have like pregnancy, you have certain weight. And then there's like multiple algorithms to combine it together and average it out. So that's very simplified version. You check on the paper. There's a like very comprehensive like, uh, that you don't say comprehensive, it's like you can follow and you know, see how they get all the weights. So for myself, I'm, I'm interested to pick up this. So there are, David's telling me to actually ask for, to actually dissect this and see what kind of uh, people that we need for this program. So let's see that there we need two kinds. The first is that we need some medical experts. So like I said before, the, one of the main challenge here is to actually know what kind of weight to assign for each series. So for a paper cut, for example, maybe you have a weight of one. For pregnancy, maybe you have like weight of ten or something. So there are different degrees. And they won't know as unless you have some connections hospitals. 
So for SMU, we actually partner with Sun Tianhua Hospital. So for myself and also one of my friends, we actually like, my friends who work at Sun Tianhua Hospital for some analytics. So one possible, uh, possible way of doing this is to actually go down to talk to the doctors, talk to the Sun Tianhua Hospital people, and show them the data, and actually understand what are the syndromes to actually take note of, what are the reality weights that you can come up with. Then from here, from based on the and let's go here, is of course the, we need a new film and turn out some algorithms. So you understand data, you do some programming and stuff, and in collaboration with the Tema Hospital, we might be able to come up with an interesting solution to address this heritage price problem. Of course, we need 3 million is another nice thing to have, but well, realistically speaking, there are people, people who are winning it, probably is like spending some time on it. So realistically speaking, I don't think we will the but it's still an interesting uh, thing to try out. So if I'm interested, can I talk with me and talk about this further? Any questions? Good. All right, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you.
machine learning course um, last year from Stanford, okay? Um, so he left and he formed, he formed Coursera, which is like the hot new online training startup. And he's doing his uh, machine learning course again, starting next Monday. So I posted on our Facebook page and, and on the users group, uh, uh, Google group, maybe we should get a group together, people that want to do machine learning. Um, and have some domain expertise so they can become a data scientist. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I posted that on our Facebook page. So if there's a group of people that are interested in, in getting together, maybe like meeting up weekly and you know, making sure you know like we get the stuff done, we get our assignments done, and keep ourselves on track, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, you may you probably uh, maybe heard about Up Singapore is an urban innovation festival which is going to take place in uh, May, or no, in June and July of this year. So I just wanted to give a, uh, a brief introduction here tonight. I think a lot of you will be interested in some of the activities around data, technology, and new applications that, uh, that are part of the festival. So a few slides to go through. Basically what we're doing is we're creating an open platform for urban innovation where engaged citizens can come together uh, work with the data and technology and help solve some social and environmental issues here in Singapore and that apply to cities uh, globally. Uh, the way we're doing this is basically creating a sandbox of data, big, open, and real-time data sets that come from government organizations here in Singapore, from private companies that we're part partnering with, and even sourced from the cloud from different types of uh, mobile applications that can provide data. So we create this big data sandbox and then bring a lot of great people together to come and start Visioning what's the future of cities, what is the new app that can help make cities cleaner, cleaner, better, and safer places to live, and uh, spend working project teams to actually build new homes. Uh, this is actually building off of an event that was done last year in San Francisco called the Summer of Smart. It was the same idea about three to five years ago. The city of San Francisco opened up their public data sets um, to the city. And uh, the idea was to create a platform where people could build applications, put out that data, and um, see what kind of services they could provide that the city could then take on. So um, the partners that we work with them uh, in called the Great Area Foundation for the Arts, they use that platform of, uh, of data in San Francisco, held a big festival, brought in you know, uh, government employees to work on it, people from the arts community, the tech community, to build these projects that help make the city smarter and better. Data. So we're taking that as inspiration and um, organizing Pop Singapore uh, here this year. And what it will be, we'll have uh, a couple, three main events that we'll have. So the first one will be in July, in, uh, June 15th, and it's what we're calling City Camp Workshop. So this will be sort of a, a lesson learning session. We'll have some speakers that come from San Francisco to share the experience that they have there, uh, the experience from the, the the government side in San Francisco, how do you open up data, how do you get people engaged, and then from the ground up, the grassroots side, to so organize the festival, how do you get uh, NGOs working with government agencies and the corporation that stays to make this stuff happen. So we'll have this workshop weekend event, uh, June 15th to 17th. The following weekend, before the festival, will be a hackathon. So we're organizing what we'll call an urban prototyping weekend, and that's where we unveil the sandbox we have these data sets, I'll show you in a second, the data that we're, we're collecting. But uh, we make that available. It'll be held up at Fusionopolis, uh, one north, and uh, probably 250 people that will show up. Uh, 
Friday night with your kitchen idea, any idea you have that can help you through the single floor of the city, uh, that you will form the meeting and then spend the Saturday and Sunday afternoon working on that project, hacking together something, kind of prototype. So typical hackathon passion, but focus on smarter cities and sort of sustainable and energy services cities. And then all of this will culminate in the World City Summit. This is a big urban conference they have every two years here in Singapore. It's a big event where they bring in 300 mayors from around the world, 700 global business leaders to talk about the urban sustainability and the future of cities. So we've been invited to tell this up Singapore story. Um, a lot of their discussions will be sort of at a top level, top down. Um, how do you plan a city? How do you run a city? Ours is sort of from the ground up. How can the citizens contribute to making cities better places? So we're excited to be there, um, presenting the up story, and also showcasing the winning projects that come out of the hackathon. Uh, I think everyone here is very interested in data, so we're, we're really excited to be working with the Economic Development Board in Singapore. They're helping us to link up with great private sector data partners. So we're putting together this data sandbox of data that's really never been open to the public before. So Singtel is already on board giving us um, mobile phone geolocation data for a whole day's worth of uh, every few minutes where every single person on the phone in Singapore is to track that throughout the time. So that's quite exciting. LTA is uh, on board. But, but will they have my girlfriend's phone number? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Or will it be anonymized? <laughs> I'll be better. That will be available. Which girlfriends? <laughs> yeah, all, all. Okay. Okay. <laughs> They'll be a cross, proper, cross <laughs> So Singtel's on board, LTA with, um, with some of the transportation data, ERP, gantry data we're talking to them about, NUS Google Computing Group, a local developer that has uh, mobile phone apps that have location data they're sharing, Metro Parking, Car Park Agency, uh, Singapore Land Authority, all these different companies um, and government agencies are really excited about this. They see it as an innovation opportunity for themselves and for their city. So. Um, these are the ones who are confirmed and on board. We're also talking with some of the bus companies, taxi companies like Comfort Delgro, Changi Airport. So we're really expecting this to be a, a really unique uh, data sandbox, not just in Singapore, but around the world. And it's a great opportunity for people to come look at this data and explore what kind of new creative solutions can we come up with. Um, I, I always like to say that Singapore, up Singapore will be successful with uh, data, people, and ideas. So the, the data we talked about, the people, it's about getting the right mix of people. So more than just a typical hackathon where it's people like us in the room that are sort of tech savvy, the, the statisticians and things like that. To make this a really interesting city-focused hackathon, we want to bring in NGOs, government agencies, art communities, schools, um, and as well as the tech developers. We would have this interesting mix of this new, new data set with new groups of people working together. So this is going back to what David was saying about meeting not just the, the technical side, but also the people who know the issues on the ground, with, uh, with the knowledge and expertise. So we're working very hard to do outreach and get the right stakeholders involved. So quite excited yeah. about this. Be, be, because if we looked at problems in Singapore, we'd all want to figure out like why there isn't more Wi-Fi access points. And you know, it, it's, it takes more than that to run a city. Um, and then on the idea side, so we also, at News and Circus, we've developed this tool called the uh, Do Good Network, which has one component that's called, the, it's called CoLab. So this is an online opportunity where people can pitch ideas for challenges in the city, some issues you want to solve, how do I, how can bicycling to work be easier in Singapore? You can pitch that idea on here. Anybody in the community here in Singapore or around the world can participate, read your description, read your challenge post inspiration, post ideas, and get some dialogue going before this hackathon. Um, get some ideas going, sharing references, sharing some data. And then you come, it converges, and you have this weekend hackathon, this two-day event in June, where you can build on these ideas and actually build a prototype. So we've got the data sandbox, we've got the people that we're inviting, and then this tool to help really make rich ideas. And then one note on the World City Summit event. Um, this will be exciting. We're, as I mentioned, we're partnering with the Singapore Economic Development Board. They're very, very interested in building a whole data ecosystem here in, in Singapore, a data economy. So uh, they're partnering with us at this event. And then the winning projects that come from the, the prototyping weekend will be showcased in front of this high profile audience of mayors from around the world, but also um, invited into an incubator that Vision Service is running. 
would be eligible for up to $250,000 in funding to take the prototype, their idea from a prototype to do an actual sustainable business. So it's quite an exciting incentive. Um, and these are projects that benefit the city, but also can be turned into a real business. And then just finally, the ways that everyone here can be involved, um, definitely to participate in the prototyping weekends. We need a lot of people with uh, data processing skills, interest in uh, coding and doing applications and things like that. So uh, I encourage everyone here to, to sign up. Uh, uh, our website's going live on Monday. So it's upsingapore.com. Uh, you can check out the details. Um, but also data sets. We're, we have the sandbox, but you know, we're still collecting more data, so if anybody has any contacts or interest in data sets or anything you can use that would help uh, on Singapore, let me know, let my colleague Kiran know. Um, in particular, if anybody has any contacts at NETS, we have a new NETS and NETS data, NTUC and some of the retail uh, data, I'd be interested in the And a few people are really, are really interested in hungry go where. If anybody has any contacts at NETS, let me know. <coughs> And then finally, uh, glad you work for different IT companies or tech companies. We're still looking for sponsorship. It's a big festival. There's plenty of room for people to be involved on a corporate level, uh, sponsoring cash. But also, we'd like to have some other prizes at the hackathon. So if your company would like to donate some gadgets or iPads or things like that, um, happy to accept it. And uh, we, can, we can hand them out to all the great participants. So again, uh, this is Up Singapore. If you have any contacts, a few main parts that can will be later. Email address is up here. Email at me anytime if you have questions about participating, sponsorship, or, or data. Um,